Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're finishing off with the World Video Bible School's video titled Miracles and Earth's Apparent Age. So far we've got, yeah, the Earth might look like it's billions of years old if we just concern ourselves with boring things like evidence, but have you considered magic? Let's see where he goes from here! The fact that the Earth appeared older than it actually was at creation is also perfectly logical in light of the nature of God's miracles. Oh? You have some insight into the nature of God's miracles that could explain how they work? Or why they never seem to work the same way twice? Like, seriously, what are the physics behind God having extended the daylight hours for Joshua to win his battle? Did the whole solar system have to stop, or just the Earth and Moon? And why would Jesus have to heal a blind guy by spitting in his eyes? That's just gross and unsanitary. Or how about just an actual explanation for why the rock layers are so perfectly delineated? You don't see a gradient like you would from one flood event. Is that a miracle? Did God go out of his way to bury things in a manner that would lead to the obvious conclusion being an old earth rather than the flood? When Jesus miraculously turned water to wine, he didn't plant a vine, wait for the grapes to grow over the course of several years, and then harvest them. No, he just performed a party trick that any half-decent magician could do. And what's more, this is the first miracle that Jesus ever performed. His first one, the highest priority for God's first demonstration of his power in human form, was to turn water into wine in front of a bunch of drunk people so they could get even more drunk. And don't try and tell me they weren't drunk. In verse 10, the master of the feast says, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Which very strongly suggests that the people have drunk freely at this point, and normally would be considered too drunk to notice that they were being served bad wine. So, just a thought, Jesus approves of party animals. He supernaturally bypassed this normal, time-laden process and instantaneously made an extremely tasty drink. Allegedly. Like I said, it's a trick that magicians can do today. In fact, Wolfgang Moser did one better. He poured water in a pot, and then from the pot poured red wine in one glass and white wine in the next glass, and then finished off with a glass of beer for himself before going through two more people, one of whom got a mixed drink, and the other got a cup of coffee, all out of the same pot. The people tasting it assured us that the drinks were real, not just colored water, and the glasses and pots were inspected by them before the trick was performed, so obviously this is miraculous, right? When Jesus fed several thousand men, women, and children with only five loaves of bread and two fish, he didn't make the large amounts of bread needed to feed this many people after planting a crop of wheat, waiting for months for it to grow, and then harvesting, threshing, grinding, and baking it. You're right, that one would be a bit more impressive. So, can you demonstrate that it actually happened? Maybe a repeat performance? Again, Jesus bypassed a lengthy natural process and miraculously created bread. Yeah, sure. In a 2,000-year-old story. And it's not the age that makes it unbelievable, it's the fact that it's a story. If I found a biography of Helen Keller that said she became deafblind by miraculously healing a deaf person and a blind person by taking their deafness and blindness on herself, I would not believe it. You would have to have more than just, this book says so. At least if you want to have any chance of convincing anyone, that is. Likewise, God made the creation full grown. He made the fruit tree, not just a seed that would eventually grow into a fruit-bearing tree. So, does that mean he made a bunch of already exploded stars, but with their light headed to Earth as though they had not yet exploded? Because there are a bunch of those supernova out there, far enough away that they can't have gone nova in the last 6,000 years, and yet we observed them when it happened. He created every winged bird, not eggs from which birds would hatch months later. You know, if we assume that the days in Genesis are meant in a more metaphorical or allegorical sense, he easily could have created a bunch of eggs and planted a bunch of seeds and waited for the things to grow and hatch. And this is supported by the Bible. Genesis 3.8 explicitly says that God planted a garden in Eden. It doesn't say that he made it all appear fully developed. He planted it. It took time. Why would the Bible say that he planted a garden if that's not what he did? Especially in a part of the Bible that you want us to take literally. He created a full-grown man capable of walking, talking, working, and procreating. I feel like you're missing the point. 
We don't say that the Earth is old because it superficially appears to be old. It's because we can directly measure the ages of certain materials, and these ages have been determined to be in the billions of years in many cases. Now, sure, you could appeal to some form of Last Thursdayism if you like, where God created the world in a way just to make it look older than it is, but then the God you're wanting me to believe in has to be extremely deceitful in order to do that. For people, it kinda makes sense. Make Adam fully grown so that he can just get right to work. But why the planet? Why would he make billions of years worth of geologic history when he could just make it look young? It's not like the planet is incapable of doing its job if it is younger. There's no reason the rocks that we can date had to come back with old ages. All the Earth had to be is a rock with a certain proportion of minerals, gases, and other chemicals on it to allow us to live. It didn't need such a rich geologic history to accomplish this. Nor did it need some stars to be created dead, but appearing to still be burning when everything else was created. God miraculously made a mature creation. Which was a really dumb thing to do if he expected us to believe that his creation was not mature. Certainly one of the most amazing, time-defying, mature miracles of God's creation was the creation of the heavenly bodies on day four. Yeah, it took him three whole days to figure out the solar system, but then the stars are just done in a single sentence. Almost like the people who wrote the story didn't understand that our sun was just one of many stars, most of which have solar systems of their own. God had previously made light, intrinsic light, on day one of the creation. What exactly is intrinsic light? Intrinsic generally would just mean that it originates from within whatever thing you're talking about. So it would be a weird way to say it, but you could say that sunlight is intrinsic to the sun. Are you trying to say that there was just ambient light with no light sources? Photons bouncing around that came from nowhere? That's just a weird way to say that. But sure, God magically made light with no light sources. On day four, he made the generators of light. Since light travels something like six trillion miles per year, and since some stars are an estimated 15 billion light years away, evolutionists assume that the universe must be at least 15 billion years old. I mean, as always, there's more to it than that, but yeah, if by evolutionists you mean astronomers, that is how long it would have taken the light from these distant objects to reach us. Otherwise, how could we see the light from stars that are so far away? There are two main creationist theories that I've heard on this matter. Jason Lyle has his light travels faster in some directions than in others hypothesis, which, as absurd as it sounds, actually has its basis in a real problem in physics, but as per usual, the creationist side is misrepresenting it. It only applies under an extreme magnetic field, and this was predicted in the 1970s and was experimentally verified in 2011. And under a magnetic field that is approximately 20,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field, it made a difference in velocity of about one billionth of a millisecond, which is essentially negligible even on the scale of billions of light years. The other option, and the one you seem to be aiming for here, is the God made the light in transition thing, which then just makes God look like a deceptive asshole. He made things look as though events had already happened, and allowed us to watch the light showing these events as having happened, but none of it is real. It's just an illusion. God tweaked the light to make it look one way when in reality it was completely different. And it's not just light either, the gravity waves had to match it. So those black holes whose collision caused a gravity wave that was detected in 2015? Yeah, they never crashed into each other. God made the gravity waves already most of the way to the Earth when he made the universe. God could have just made one black hole and not had to bother with any of the gravity waves, but no, he wanted there to be two objects creating waves that looked like they had been traveling for over a billion years, only to merge into one object for reasons. Now, maybe he just wanted us to be able to do the science or whatever, but why couldn't he have planned a gravity wave generating event 6,000 light years from the Earth instead of over a billion? It strains credulity to believe that God wants us to believe in a young Earth, but made single black holes that when we observe them appear to have come from a merger of two other black holes that, according to this model, never even existed in the first place. Once again, the answer, or at least a major part of the answer, to this supposed conundrum goes back to the fact that God worked an amazing miracle at creation. Is it an amazing miracle to be constrained to our human concept of time? Wouldn't it be a greater miracle to make the universe that is older than it is even possible for humans to conceptualize? Seriously, the Bible says on more than one occasion that the heavens are a sign of God's glory and power, or whatever. 
I don't know about you, but I would find it way more awe-inspiring if it were demonstrably older than I can even imagine than for it to all just be 10,000 years old but made to look older because God had to stick to six literal days for some unknown reason. Or worse, because the ancient Hebrews were too stupid to figure out that a week should be six working days and one resting day if the creation story weren't literal 24-hour days. When God created the heavenly bodies, the generators of light, on day four, He simultaneously and supernaturally made their light to appear on earth. Yeah, I called it. God magically made the light already in transit. That is such a bad explanation. Like, even when I was a creationist, I couldn't accept these lousy explanations. The lack of anything even resembling a good reason for us to be able to see stars that are billions of light years away is why I didn't ever get around to officially declaring my belief in a young Earth, instead preferring to leave that as a nebulous concept. Light that might naturally take long amounts of time to reach Earth miraculously reached Earth in an instant. Magic. Just as God had said on day one, let there be light, and there was light, on day four he said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens, and it was so. I don't know, man. To me, that just looks like the ancient Hebrews didn't understand just how vast the universe is. And since the cosmology of the Bible, if taken absolutely literally, not the wishy-washy literal that you're advocating for, but actually taking it at its word, it depicts the universe in the same way as the other Near Eastern civilizations of the time. So it's either magic, or the Hebrew cosmology was similar to its neighbors and none of them understood what stars really are. These lights were created to give light on the earth and to divide the day from the night. God also set them in the firmament of the heavens for signs and seasons and for days and years. Yeah, for signs and seasons. They are for telling the seasons, sure, but they are also for signs. In other words, astrology, predicting the future using the stars. And not in the condemned along with witchcraft kind of way, this is God explicitly stating that astrology is one of the reasons he invented the stars. Why don't more creationists practice astrology as their Lord intended? God had a purpose for creating the heavenly bodies. Yeah, he magically made them with their light already en route to the earth so that you could magically predict things with them. Sounds legit. And he made them so that man benefited from them without having to wait long periods of time for their light to reach earth. Yup. God made the whole fucking universe just for our benefit. But now here, my discussion of gravitational waves becomes relevant again, because he would have had to make them en route as well. But they are not lights in the heavens. They are not for signs or seasons. Why would their waves not be left alone? That would actually be a decent bit of evidence for a young Earth. Sure, the visible light stretches across a sphere that is some 46 billion light years wide, but we can't detect anything outside of the visible light spectrum more than 10 to 20,000 light years away. Surely such an accomplishment is within God's power. You're already up to your eyebrows in magical explanations for things that we have excellent natural explanations for. Why not go one deeper in a demonstration that would support the idea of a young Earth? And disclaimer, I actually have no idea how big our visible light sphere would be if the universe really was 6,000 years old. It's not a straightforward calculation thanks to the expansion of space-time, so take my 10 to 20,000 year estimate with a grain of salt. Starlight didn't have to travel for 15 billion years before reaching Earth. When God made Adam and Eve two days after His creation of the heavenly bodies, the first couple immediately profited from God's miraculous creation of starlight. Yes, which is why my question then becomes, why did they also profit from a bath of all of the rest of the EM spectrum, not to mention the gravity waves and anything else that is invisible to the naked eye? Why wouldn't God just let those ones obey normal physics in a display of His power and glory? Hell, even with just the visible light, Adam and Eve didn't have access to the Hubble Space Telescope. They didn't need the visible light from Icarus, the farthest individual star to have ever been imaged, at a distance of 5 billion light years. They couldn't see it either way. Yet there it lay, for signs and seasons, for people who couldn't even see it, even though its light was reaching them. God spoke the stars and their light rays into existence, similar to how God created full-grown trees in one day 
Well, I mean, he planted the garden after he created Adam. I guess you could argue that he was planting full-grown trees. But when you're the one doing the creating, why create a tree out of soil and then go through the motion of planting it when you could have just created a full-grown tree in the soil? There seems to be some inconsistency here. Which, if cut down, may have had dozens or hundreds of visible tree rings. Oh, now that's a whole new can of worms right there. Why would they have visible tree rings if they were created fully grown? Tree rings are a representation of a growing season. If they were made full grown, that is one growing season. There should only be one ring to rule them all. Unless God was deliberately trying to mess with us, there is no reason to give them tree rings right from the beginning. Indeed, considering the nature of God's miracles at creation, a star that might appear to be extremely old is actually only a few thousand years old. Just, you know, any stars that you can't see with the naked eye were still up there being completely useless for the purpose that God himself said they had, and yet their light had to be reaching us because reasons. The fact that the earth and the universe may appear much older than it is in no way bolsters the case for evolution. I mean, evolution stands on its own merits, but it did take time. Sure, you can last Thursday it away if you want, claiming that the species were created already appearing to be in transition or whatever, but ultimately, you're appealing to magic in an attempt to dismiss vast mountains of evidence, and then you want this appeal to magic to be taken seriously in scientific communities. Sorry, that's just not how it works. God's Word reveals that both the miracle of a mature creation and the cataclysmic flood are adequate explanations. Firstly, the Bible does no such thing. It reads like an attempt by an ancient people to understand things that were beyond their comprehension. Second, even if the Bible were trying to provide an adequate explanation for the appearance of an old earth when the earth is in fact young, then it failed miserably. A story of an event for which there is zero evidence is not an adequate explanation for why the vast majority of several different scientific fields of study, including but not limited to astronomy, biology, and geology, are wrong. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Joe, whatever that last name is, who says, I know you're not very appreciative of Christ's personal sacrifice on your behalf, but one day when you stand before him, he will show you how he didn't have to. He could have stuck with carpentry, but he chose to sacrifice himself to save any who appreciate God's gift. Uh, Joe, I know that Jesus didn't have to die to save us from himself. That was my whole point. He is supposed to be all-powerful, meaning there didn't ever need to be blood sacrifices. He could just choose to forgive people without something having to die first. If he can't do that, then he's not all-powerful. If he can do that and he chooses not to, then he likes to wallow in blood. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the miracles that make my channel possible. If you'd like to keep my channel firmly outside the realm of science, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, which are linked in the description, as well as my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address, and also my podcast thing if you want to hear this all in one go without uh, YouTube doing its weird things that it likes to do sometimes there's a podcast link down below you can use this as a podcast podcast i'll say podcast again podcast see you next time